All right, continuing forth in the book of Acts, July 4th edition, chapter 8. Over a fourth of the way through it, it's kind of a long book. It uh, has some long chapters, and there are 28 chapters, and so seven. the seventh chapter was a fourth of the way, 14, half, and... Um, there's 28, and so I'm, I'm going to go through chapter 8. That'll leave me with 20 more. It's quite a bit more, but uh, this one's separated into, uh, I think, four different sections or something. I kind of like it when it's separated into more sections, so I can uh, kind of examine the, the sections separately. And, um, you know, as opposed to the last chapter, chapter 7, where it was, you know, Stephen's speech and the stoning of Stephen, it was all kind of like one whole thing. But uh, let's see. So... Uh, Saul was there at the stoning of Stephen, and um, this is where we're going to continue. Saul ravages the church. Now, this section is only a few chapter or a few verses, but verse one: And Saul was consulting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Okay, um, <clears throat> so. Saul was pleased with the death of Stephen. Saul, uh, who's going to later be converted and become Paul, he was an unbeliever still at this point. He was one of those Jews who, um, you know, looked to the law as uh, as justification. And so uh, when this persecution started happening, the church was scattered out. And... Um, you know, probably the believers fled to different places. They were being killed and stuff. And, uh, you know, it says, except the apostles. So I guess the except, I guess the apostles weren't scattered abroad. Um, they stuck around, uh, Jerusalem, I guess. Um, verse two, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. They were sad that Stephen was dead. That's totally understandable. Verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. So uh, he uh, went into the homes of these believers and sent them to prison. It sounds almost like you know, Nazi Germany or something where the Gestapo just going into the houses. Oh... Uh, Pretty wild, and even today, probably. Um, I mean, I don't know I, necessarily, but in some of the Muslim countries and stuff, how they persecute the Christians. I don't know if you know. I know they they have the Christians live in ghettos and stuff like that. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, so now we're gonna transition over to uh, look at Philip. I guess Philip proclaims Christ in Samaria. So Acts eight verse four. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there were great joy in that city. So Philip preached Christ to the people in Samaria. And um, he also did miracles. And so Philip was doing miracles. Stephen was doing miracles. Apparently a lot of people were doing miracles back then. There's a lot of question about people being possessed. You know, there it talk, in the Gospels it talks about Jesus casting out demons. And um, we see it in the book of Acts. And later on, I think, in the epistles of Paul and stuff, we don't really hear much about it. But it's very interesting. Does it happen today? And, uh, you know, as I said, just with, like, the Pentecostals, and, and they look at all these things that happen in the book of Acts, you know, telling, uh, you know, a lame man to get up and walk. And uh, <clears throat> Benny Hinn imitates these things. And, you know, so I wouldn't really encourage stuff like that. But... Um, I haven't really studied a lot or thought about it a lot. You know, there's a lot of uh, Christians who base, you know, all their beliefs on things like this, like casting out demons and, um, you know, what is 
what are we to think of, um, you know, Satan and demons today and uh, their influence and everything? Um, <clears throat> and, then, and then there's people, you know, that, that aren't believers, you know, the non-believers, they think that the demon possession was just a misunderstanding with, you know, mental health or whatever back in the day, but uh, that's not what we learned from Scripture. But, you know, what about the activity today? Um, really interesting. So, uh, and you know, I would think even, even if there are people possessed with demons today and stuff, uh, when the apostles cast them out and stuff, you know, they cast them out through the power of Jesus. Even though, you know, people like Benny Hinn and stuff would say that, yeah, that's what they're doing. They're casting them out through the power of Jesus. But, I don't know. Uh, I don't really think a lot about that stuff. Um, <clears throat> I'm just concerned with, you know, you know, my major concern is studying the Bible and stuff. But, I mean, obviously spreading the gospel and, and telling people about Jesus. Uh, but... Anyway, I don't know. We do see it in the book of Acts, so people possessed with spirits, they're being cast out. Miracles are happening, you know, through the disciples. Simon the magician believes. Now this, I guess Acts chapter 8, I've went to a lot early on, um, because, like I said earlier, Acts has to do a lot with repentance and stuff like that. You see it specifically mentioned in Acts, but also... Um, we have the story of Simon, the sorcerer, who's going to, you know, it says that he believes what's being said, but, but then you see that um, through his actions or, you know, that uh, he only believed it for, you know, gain, basically, that, that he could use it for his own gain and um, not for his salvation. And so there's the idea of the false convert here and, um, you know, a, a false repentance, a false faith, basically. And then there's those that argue that, well, Simon really did believe he really was saved, he really did have faith in Christ, but then uh, but then he lost it or whatever, that it can be lost. But that's not what I see, but let's read through it. Once again, Acts chapter 8, verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And so they were saying that, you know, he had the power of God, basically, with the things that he was doing. Verse 11 says, And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So Simon believed, and he was baptized. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So this is all very interesting, too. And I've looked into it a lot, and I don't know what I can say much about it now, off the top of my head, but, you know, what I'm talking about is the, the fact that, you know, some of them believed, and they were baptized, but they didn't receive the Holy Ghost. And like I said before, that I believe that anyone who's born again is indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and so that's not what it's talking about. And I talked about how the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a special empowerment, and so maybe that was it. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that when Peter and John laid their hands on them, that's when they received it. Um, so that's, 
Very interesting. And Simon saw that through laying on the hands of the Holy Ghost was given, that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. And, you know, a lot of times, maybe before I've tied together this laying on of hands with, with the Holy Spirit, with uh, salvation because of the gift of God. Um, you know, because other places in, in Romans or whatever, they, they talk about how salvation is the gift of God, you know. And, um, but that doesn't mean that this is either. There are lots of gifts of God, right? Um, so this would be more of a spiritual blessing, I would think, like a, um, you know, like a spiritual gift, in a sense. So, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart, thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And so it would seem like if he was in the bond of iniquity, in the gall of bitterness, that he was not um, saved. And, well, then answered Simon and said, Pray ye the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And so, um, you know, there's lots of ways that this is looked at, and I suppose there's different ways it could be looked at. Some of the things seem kind of vague. Well, Simon the Sorcerer. But, you know, we do know that he was rebuked by uh, Peter. Was it Peter that was talking to him? Yeah. Okay, he was rebuked by Peter, so that's not a good thing. Um, you know, I just have a feeling from what I read that he never really understood what he was doing um, when he believed and was baptized. I think he was just kind of following along. And uh, so, I don't know. I've looked at that a lot. I'm sure I'll go over that much more. Philip and the... Ethiopian eunuch. Acts chapter 8 verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And again, the angel of the Lord, different from what we see in the Old Testament, probably just an angel. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him, and read the prophet Isaiah, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a slam dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the, the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, 
that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Okay. So we see the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. So, I don't know, that just makes me think that Philip went on traveling uh, to preach, you know, uh, in the Spirit. He was led of the Spirit, you know, to go elsewhere. And, you know, he zipped out of there or something. You know, and another reason why I want to think that Simon the Sorcerer is not saved, too, is because as I'm reading this, I'm seeing, like, there's two different accounts. You know, there's one of one who professed to believe and was baptized, but he wasn't right in his heart. He wasn't right with his intentions. And um, and then we have the story of the eunuch and Philip, which is more of, you know, the right way to go about it. And um, And even after, you know, after Philip was saved, we see... Or, or, never mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, anyway, um, the eunuch went on rejoicing. Um, I was going to say the eunuch went on preaching, but it was Philip that went on preaching. The eunuch probably did go on and preach, but we don't see that here. But he went on his way rejoicing. Um, you know, he was interested in the scriptures and what it said, and he wanted to believe. Whereas Simon, I think, just kind of followed else, and, and he wanted it for the wrong reason. Anyway, I went over this chapter a lot, so it's a big important one. We're going to move on to chapter 9, Acts. God bless.